Hi, this is Mike Hendrickson from AI Conference in New York. I'm here with Yufeng from Google. Yufeng, how are you doing? Very good, thanks Mike. So you're with the Cloud and TensorFlow group, or can you explain kind of where you sit in Google? Sure, so I'm on the Cloud Developer Advocacy team, and I focus on machine learning. Developer advocates, we are kind of the bridge between the outside uh, developer community who uses our Google's developer products, and we sit between them and the internal product and engineering teams. So we help kind of bridge that line of communication. So that means we go both ways. Externally, we might present at conferences, make videos, maybe such as this, write blog posts, things like that, interact with the community, and through that, collect the feedback and learn about what's working, what's confusing, what's hard, and bring that feedback back into the developer teams and the engineering teams making those products and helping make that better. So you're with a particularly interesting group, though. I mean, cloud and then TensorFlow is part of that or related to that? Yeah, so TensorFlow is Google's open source machine learning library. Google open sourced that in late 2015, and since then, it's really uh, grown spectacularly in popularity. The community, the community around that has been really fantastic. And TensorFlow, while being open source, means that you can run it anywhere. We wanted to make it easy for you to run it at scale. For folks with a lot of data or really complicated training jobs, being able to run machine learning in the cloud is definitely something that folks want to be able to do. And so uh, Cloud Machine Learning Engine is our kind of packaged product that provides managed infrastructure to run TensorFlow in the cloud. And what's great about it is that you can take your experimental TensorFlow code that you ran on your local machine, say with a subset of your data, and just push it up to the cloud with no real meaningful like changes that you have to make. You don't have to use any kind of, there's no machine learning engine um, SDK or library you need to add in. It's just TensorFlow code, and you pull in your data and let it run. And you just pass in some parameters specifying how many machines you want. Do you want graphics units like GPUs and things like that to accelerate your training? But the actual machine learning code gets to remain the same, that same open source code. Sounds like a developer could use this to go wide and deep. <laughs> and and we, we talked a little bit yeah. about that, but it sounds like you're covering great breadth, and then you can also go in deep on things? or. Yeah, help. so in terms of um, the, the tooling, or the, so with the tooling, you can, you know, TensorFlow is for custom models. When you want to train your own models, it's great for research and it's great for production because you can kind of translate um, and use them for both without really needing to change your code because everything can be written in Python, which is very friendly to development, but then it all gets compiled down when at execution time to C++, so then it's very fast. TensorFlow is built on a distributed C++ execution engine, and that allows it to run very quickly in a distributed environment. Uh, on the going wide side, I mean, there's the community aspect of it, which is really great. You know, you, it covers a wide breadth of different types of research and models, and what's really been interesting is, since it's been open source, we've really seen a growth in um, research being published using TensorFlow. And what I mean by that is, not only is the research being published as a PDF with the article explaining their methods, explaining their results, drawing some nice charts, but then the code shows up on GitHub and it's TensorFlow code. And folks you know, from the community, they can take that code and they can run it, which means we have reproducible science. And that's really fantastic. So is easy way to find that, just search for TensorFlow on GitHub? Yeah, so on GitHub we have a TensorFlow organization. So the actual um, TensorFlow code itself is open source, the entire library, so that's just um, github.com slash tensorflow slash tensorflow again, because the first one is the organization, and mm -hmm. the second one is the repository. Okay. And if you want to look at some of the models that, um, these are specifically mm -hmm. the Google ones, it would be tensorflow uh, slash models. Okay. So this morning uh, we had some really interesting keynotes talking about uh, machine learning and AI in medical. And I know John Hopkins is doing some really interesting things there. Is is this where we are in in the world right now? With we're just starting our AI journey because mm -hmm. it, it seems like we have a long ways to go to actually make this work. But it seems like we're on the journey now, and it's really starting to get going. Yeah, is that where you see it? Yeah, it really feels like things are picking up pace. Um, even a few short years ago, a lot of this couldn't have been conceivable as things that we could either do or kind of get away with doing, but, you know, whether it's compliance issues and privacy and things like that, kind of preventing a lot of this development from happening. But we've overcome some of those hurdles, 
and now we're seeing leaps and bounds in advances in both the research and the science. Uh, one of the things I'll, I'll call out is a lot of the kind of image-related things, you, you kind of alluded to this, whether it's like skin cancer detection, uh, there's one for diabetic retinopathy, so that's um, looking at the back of the eye. Those images, if you look at some of them, they're, they're, and you compare the two, one is showing a healthy eye, and the other one is one that's like starting to degenerate. And the difference is so subtle. Even when someone marks it, it's like it's that little little area right there that's slightly different. And to have um, you know that systems that can detect that is really fantastic because trained doctors are not exactly they're going to miss the it. most plentiful. <laughs> or will they miss it, the doctor? For sure. I mean, occasionally they might miss it, but I think the more notable point here is that it's a highly specialized skill to do to do this task. And the availability of these doctors, especially beyond um, places like the U.S., right, in, say, third world countries and just in rural places where you don't have access to that level of uh, specialized care, allows this kind of, well, I wouldn't say democratization of medicine, but uh, more of just access to uh, this type of medicine. And what's really nice about this particular application is that it is a highly treatable situation, but only if detected early. early yeah. And if not, you go get and you uh, end up with permanent blindness. So the the two are so starkly different. So it, it made it for a really worthwhile kind of uh, task to get after. So you're giving a talk later today. Yeah. So on wide and deep. That's right. So speaking of you know going wide and deep on the topic, uh, later today I'll be talking about a machine learning model. It's a piece of research that Google Brain published a few years ago called Wide and Deep, and what it uh, what's interesting about it is that since then, it has been packaged into TensorFlow. It's one of the library calls in, it, in TensorFlow itself. And that makes it really easy to use as kind of a first pass on structured data. So that instead of just throwing it in a spreadsheet charting app and just drawing a linear line, you can get a much more sophisticated level of prediction for you know, only a little bit more effort because the tooling has gotten to that stage where you can essentially use virtually the same code and just swap out the data set. So Yufeng, if you and I were to sit down 12 months from now and have the same conversation, what would you like to say has changed with TensorFlow during that 12 month period? What would you like to see Google doing differently 12 months from now? Yeah, so in, in the next year I think what will really uh, enable uh, even greater uptake of machine learning and artificial intelligence development will be further improvements in the tooling. As good as it is today, there are still many places for improvements, and, and this is one of the areas where I work in, right? Bringing that feedback and trying to figure out how can we make it even easier for developers to get started, keep going, and you know, really uh, spread their wings and make either contributions also back to the library itself, which is fantastic, as well as developing their own models and coming up with you know, creative ways to use machine learning. I think just like the internet enabled a whole new space of possibilities of, of what was possible, so too will machine learning enable us to do things that we can't even imagine are possible today. Mm. And I don't even mean like super crazy far-fetched ones that we think of in sci-fi. Like truly like things that we wouldn't think of, but once they arrive they become somewhat obvious sometimes. It's like, oh, why didn't we do this before? And that's, that's really exciting. In terms of the specifics around tooling, I think we could do a lot better in terms of distributed uh, machine learning. Just as a field, it's still very hard to do distributed learning. Mm -hmm. And what distributed learning allows you to do is access uh, faster training for large pools of data, distributing it across lots of machines. And are we going to start distributing that at the edge, like in the field with IoT as well? So IoT is, is a really interesting you know, piece to throw into there. There was a piece of research a few months ago called uh, Federated Machine Learning. And, and what that allowed was it ha was a method of cryptography that allowed devices at the edge, either mobile devices or IoT devices, to collect data and do s like basically special kind of like averaging of data so that it gets anonymized. Because one of the things about collecting mobile or IoT data is privacy. And so by having a cryptographically secure way of c coming, uh, combining the data together at the edge and then bringing it centrally to finish the training at, in a beefy server, 
that was a really interesting thing, and I, I think we'll see that sort of application become more and more prevalent. Excellent. Yifeng, we look forward to that conversation in 12 months. Awesome. Thanks Thank a you. lot, Mike.